Professor Terrell, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Let's have a seat. We have a little bit of time for, for Q&A. Again, uh, you're welcome in the audience and also the, the virtual audience to participate here. Um, I assume we have a lot of questions coming in. But uh, before that, let me, let me just ask you, um, and I know you try not to get too political, yet I do have to ask you, given the report that you chaired, the Commission's report for Mr. Macron. Obviously, what you just said about politicians was pretty damning. You said they lost their moral compass. Um, what's your hope for Mr. Macron as he's reading that report and he's had a terrible experience with, with the yellow vests? What do you think he will take away from this? Because he's, he's already done things like the, the public consultations, yet he's in election mode. Ex exactly. Yeah, you're completely right, Carolyn. Um, the uh, first, on, on the genesis of this report, uh, when we talk with Olivier Blanchard to Emmanuel Macron, we said we want to set up the commission herself, and we want to be completely independent. Now, there is always a question of independence when you start talking with people, because, you know, of course, you have some empathy and so on, but you know, the idea is that it's a public good. It's not something for the government. It's something for public good. Um, which, as you mentioned, is just before an election, so it's actually hard. If you think about pension reforms, uh, fighting inequality, including the inheritance tax and the you know, carbon tax, it's a perfect recipe for not being elected or re-elected. So uh, we realize that, but you know, our goal, my, my own vision on that is that uh, um, it takes time for people to appropriate ideas. Um, for the people for themselves, for the politicians. And I think it's right in a sense. And you, you can have influence on the debate. It's easier when you have an independent authority. So it's easier if you do um, competition policy or banking regulation, because then your knowledge can uh, filter through and pass, be passed through more directly into policies. But you know, with Olivier Blanchard, we did this work on the bonus model, as some kind of experience rating for France. It took 20 years to be implemented, and, and even so, in, in a very timid way. Um, well, that's okay, I think. That, that's very okay, but that's a labor policy. So labor policy is very political, and it takes time, actually, to do things. So in terms of, uh, we'll see. We'll see, actually, what shows up in, in, uh, in the programs of the, of the candidates. Uh, but, you know, there are things which can be useful. So, for example, there was this recent energy crisis, this ongoing energy crisis with very high gas prices and so on, and oil prices. And, you know, there was a big debate in France, you know, most politicians and, and most of the people wanted to have a reduction in the price of energy. And finally, the government decided for a check. And then <laughs> we said, that's good, because, you know, of course, because of the incentive property of, of prices, we have to keep a high price. And that's very important. So give a check, it's much better policy. Now, I think it was Larry Fink who wrote in a letter to bosses, corporate bosses, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, that corporations will have to come up with a shortfall, what governments weren't able to do. So obviously, the, um, the Friedman Doctrine has been somewhat re-evaluated um, by many, including Zingales. So I guess the question is, how do we set the right incentives then? If the governments don't have the right incentives, in part, I guess, because they suffer from short-termism, unless you're maybe Angela Merkel or Vladimir Putin, but you're probably only in power for four to eight years or so, or five in the, or 10 in the, in the case of France. What right incentives do we set for businesses then? Because aren't they constrained by short-termism, uh, quarterly results, for example? The well, there are two, and uh, you know, one of the things we can do, of course, is to impose a corporate governance which is stronger. So I think you know, the voice is very important to avoid, you know, an excessive short-term bonuses. You need, you know, relative performance evaluation. Be compared with your peers. You need to have a long-term perspective with clawbacks. It's not easy to do, of course. You know, I, I can hear lots of counter arguments to that, but you know, by and large, you know. We, we have seen that with, with part of the financial system in, uh, in 20, uh, 2008. Um, you know, the incentives were too short term. So, so not everybody, of course, but you know, so, so we have to intervene, uh, you know, as investors, we have to intervene in those firms. Um, now, Larry Fink, I know the business roundtable and the like, you know, it's nice, but you know, there's only so much you can expect from that. 
First, because there's a little bit of greenwashing and you're uh, looking good, right? Um, then you, you have to look at the performance. Um, does it have the same effect as, uh, as you know, carbon price? And I strongly doubt about it. And then there's this issue of the pressure of markets. That was discussed a lot today about you know, how much we could expect from uh, di divesting, for example, from oil companies and the like. And Bill Gates had an extreme uh, stance where he said, you know, it's a complete waste of time. Don't divest from oil, do other things. It's a bit extreme because there's still, uh, there's still some, some, some impact you can have through the market price. But as was discussed uh, in, the f in the previous round table, uh, oh no, two round tables ago. <laughs> it was a long day. <laughs> it was, a, yes, it was a long afternoon. Um, you know, at some point when, when a socially responsible investment grows, the, you, you have to sacrifice some returns. You know, if, if you are only one or two percent of the investment investing in, in clean stuff, you know, that's very easy. You, you buy clean stuff and there's plenty around. You buy hydroelectricity uh, shares or something like that. And then you know, people are going to sell that to you and buy oil companies. And you know, in the end, if it becomes bigger, which I hope, then people will have to accept a loss in their return. That's what economic theory predicts. And uh, you know, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. So, which doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean that you know, in the computation you also have to take into account the co-variation between you know, the systemic shock, which, because you know, it's a systemic risk. Climate change is a systemic risk. And if you have a brown portfolio, then of course you are, you are going to bear some of the systemic risk because you know, the day there is reckoning and the position intervenes, then those brown firms will be in big trouble. At the best, they will get a very high carbon price, at best. And, you know, they may get prohibition bans and, and standards and the like, which are going to be extremely expensive. So you have to take that into account. But the price sector already does that, I hope so. Um, and if, if you want to go beyond that, you have to accept sacrificing return. And, you know, a horse is worth, uh, <laughs> a planet is worth it. Before we get to the audience questions, one final question to you. It's not a very scientific one, but it's actually one that I find quite curious, and it's come up during the Q&A. Um, we haven't been able to get to it. But, you know, I think, I'm just paraphrasing now, I think um, the question goes is, are they preaching water and drinking wine? All the panels that are up here on stage, how did they even get to the conference? What difference or what costs are they willing to incur um, can I just ask you? You came from I, I, I flew. I flew in. Uh, and you feel okay about that? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to reduce my travel, and uh, there are lots of benefits of being a Nobel laureate, but you know, the a cost is that you're traveling a lot, which gives you a bad conscience. Um, and I'm no saint. I mean, uh, let's face it. You know, I'm, I'm willing to put some effort in, in various things. Um, I have an electric car because I'm well to do. But, you know, other than that, and do a couple of actions here and there like this because, you know, I want to save the planet like anybody else, but I'm no saint. And, you know, in the end, the, the price mechanism is going to help. Um, now, you know, again, you can lobby. You can lobby your government. And, I, you know, I live in Toulouse, I have to go to Paris very often. And the, the truth is that there are fast trains everywhere in France except to Toulouse. And Toulouse, it takes at the very least four and a half hours to get to Paris. Now, when I have to do that within a day or even two, it's kind of a rough. So I fly, which is terrible. So if there were a TGV going to Paris, that would be much, much better. And I will never fly again to Paris. You know, that's the kind we can put pressure on, on our governments to actually behave in a greener way. We'll have to talk to SNCF about that. Uh, thank you so much for that, for the time being. Let's open up to the audience questions. They're quite timid. I think you've answered all the questions. So yeah, far. well, I doubt it. Oh, there you go, on the far left. Thank you for your lecture. Um, could, could you just talk a little bit more about your ideas on the carbon bank? Because I, I think we all see that it's such a struggle to 
really execute these pledges at the national level. And you know, it is a supranational problem and probably needs a supranational solution. So have you given that more thought and, and what would that look like? And maybe what models have you studied in the past that might be good metaphors for that? Okay, the, the, uh, it's an interesting question. There are actually three ways of uh, doing forward guidance. The first is uh, basically to have a floor and a, and a cap. So basically, you, you commit yourself to a floor and a cap for, for the years to come. Second way, actually, I didn't mention is something I did in 1996 with Jean-Jacques Lafont, where we had, you issued pollution permits, but the government could increase or reduce the number, and they were like put options. So for example, the danger is that, you know, you, you issue pollution permits, and you may want to adjust them because, of course, there is a lot of uncertainty. But there is a danger of opportunism where the government actually is going to add more permits tomorrow. Um, but then, if you have put options on those permits, so for example, the permit, uh, the put option is at 50 euros, and if the government gets the price of permits to 20 euros because it floods the market, then the government has to pay the difference, and we showed that was kind of optimal mechanism. But it's a little bit complicated because, you know, of course, you know, it's a finance kind of mechanism. Um, another mechanism is what you are asking about, which is a carbon central bank. So the idea is that you set a number of permits. So the way it will work for the world, of course, you know, I don't expect that to work for the world, but you just have a carbon budget. You know, if you want to reach 1.5 Celsius, you have this carbon budget. The IPCC has computed that. So you issue a number of permits, which is equal to the carbon budget. We will get it wrong with priority one, because we, we don't know about technological progress, we don't know about the politics of, of carbon pricing and so on. So with priority one, we'll get it completely wrong. So you, ne you need to adjust, you need flexibility. So what you can do is to give it's just like a central bank. You give an independent authority just to take it out of politics, which is going to address a number of permits, either buy back some permits or issue new permits in order to react to news about science and society. Now, the, the proposal is not completely detailed at this stage, I have to, to warn you, but given that central banks have worked pretty well, and you know, I've even engaged in good mission creep, I mean, mission creep usually is not very good, but, you know, actually we, you know, we could think about a central bank doing a good job doing that. Uh, you know, here is the objective. We have to stick to 1.5. And depending on the, on the news, you can buy new permits, buy old permits or, or issue new permits to try to stay on the trajectory when there are news accruing. There, sorry. Okay, I'm just going to go first then. So could you imagine to incorporate um, newer forms of technology into coining these carbon banks? So for instance, could you imagine NFT token, so tokenization of those, of those carbon emissions or a saving of, of, of carbon? I I'm completely neutral with respect to, you know, whether you'll be doing blockchain or you'll have a central repository. Uh, I mean, usually for, for exchanges, you have a central repository, like for, for shares or, or the like for, for bonds. Uh, you can do one way or the other. I'm, what counts for me is the number of, of, of permits you'll issue. And then the rest, you know, I'm happy to delegate to the experts. and. Uh, in that area, I mean, I don't have a particular view on that. There was a question in the front. Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting speech. Now, there are a lot of hopes on the conclusions in Glasgow, obviously, especially from the younger generation, and also linked a little bit to this post-COVID feeling, you know, that should have an impact. Now, what would be, in your view, the dream outcome? 
of COP26. It's very, I mean, that links to the question that we'll have the answer to. I'm an optimist, so I say unlikely, <laughs> you know, that we're get, going to get any carbon price. And it's, it's clear that we, we are not going to get it in, in Glasgow. Um, then what can you get? You can get pledges, deforestation, uh, methane, and, and the like. Fine, but are they credible? Where is the measurement? What is the enforcement mechanism? That's what I'm asking for. So, you know, that was discussed in, last, in the previous sessions. You know, we have had 25 COPs. And, you know, we have made some progress. We, there's recognition and so on. But, and we need to keep that. But in the end, we need a different mechanism. It's not going to work that way. You know, COP50 is still going to be a disaster. So we need to actually have the biggest emitters actually getting together. Now, how to do it, we just don't know, actually, to be honest. So some people, many people have proposed a climate club, the coalition of the willing, basically people who are willing to handle um, things. And they, they built a wall around the climate club with a carbon tax adjustment mechanism. And they will have a, a carbon price within the wall. Um, why not? Now, you could do that, but you know, for the moment, I see Europe. The US, Joe Biden, doesn't have quite the majority to do that because he doesn't even want to mention the carbon price. Uh, that's, that's iffy, right? And then China should be there for sure. If you want to let on put uh, pressure on Putin, on Bolsonaro, on Modi, and so on, you really have to, um, to have China there. And that's another ball game as well. So, it's difficult to create a coalition that we're willing. Um, the commission discussed maybe we should have G7 because G20, we all decided G20 was out, but G7, you're having some coalition of the willing, which will be based on, on G7 um, in order not to multiply the number of, uh, of bodies in charge of that. Yes, why not? I mean, if we get at least a couple of big countries like Europe, US, and China, then we can actually move ahead and use border tax adjustment. We can use the WTO as a, as a weapon. Of course, there's a danger of getting rid of the good aspect of the WTO, making it even more political. But, you know, that kind of stuff, there's not that much. You know, there's a good reason. There are two good reasons why we haven't succeeded yet. The first is, uh, is of course, externality and free riding ac across countries. And the second, is, of course, that the main victims are not born yet and they don't vote. Um, but, you know, by and large, something I know is that the UN process is not going to work. We have to keep it. It's important to discuss things, but it's not going to be the solution. I mean, let me just follow up on that because I think currently, globally, only 20% of all emissions are covered by some form of carbon price. I think only 4 or 5% is covered by price above $40 a ton. Yeah. So what you're saying is, in a way, it doesn't really matter whether that percentage gets to 50, 60. It matters about the countries that are in it? Well, that's why we need a border tax adjustment. Because if you, if you start having carbon prices at 50 or 100 euros, as they should be, then you start to have sh offshoring. So if you don't protect your industry, it's not going to fly politically and economically. So you need to do that. Now, the question is, how do you get people to accept a carbon tax or a cap and trade? Uh, the first is to tell people a subsidy is a tax. Most people don't get it. If you ask you know, most, most people in public opinion, they think a subsidy is a free gift, but a subsidy is always a tax. And you know, if, if they don't understand that, that's, that's bad. And then the young generation, they are the most likely to act because they have the highest stake. You have to, you know, they're, they're going to say, you know, I'm willing to pay 5% of my income to, in order to solve climate change, which is nice. But then if you tell them your parents and yourself will face a carbon tax, which actually represents less than that, they won't want it. So you need to actually evangelize the idea. That's where, you know, the economic shortcomings of our education um, are going to be huge. And that we are paying for that. 
I think the climate change problem will be partly solved today if we had a better economics education. Um, and there is a lot to be said in favor of developing that already in high school. Uh, I don't know, it's done in Switzerland. In France, most people don't get an economics education in high school, and those who get it often get a very bad one. So, you know, we need actually to explain to people it can be done. After all, you know, most people, except in the U.S., are not climat climatoseptic now. They, they accept there is a science of climate. It's, you know, it's moving. Um, vaccine, there's been some progress. And, you know, and, and even if the climate scientists are wrong, we must accept the majority, what the majority says. Even sometimes they are a little bit ayatollahs in what they say. You know, th there's a consensus in science. And it's pretty good consensus as those things go. So, you know, and we see now the young people actually following this consensus. So, you know, we could also have this consensus in social sciences as well. Professor Chirol, the single question that gets the most likes because the audience can, can push a, you know, click a, a like button on the questions is a very French one. What's your personal view on the importance of nuclear power in the transition to a carbon-free economy? <laughs> yeah, it's very French. Huh? The, uh, as I said, you know, the idea is that 80% you know, of our electricity is actually carbon-free in France. And do we want to lose that? And the answer is no. I mean, that will be criminal um, because we will be using, you know, highly carbonized uh, substitutes for that. Of course, you know, we could put uh, wind and solar everywhere in France. First, it will not be accepted. It will be very expensive. And, and then... There and will as be we, sorry to interrupt, but as we see in Germany, which did the huge exit, we see that it's very unreliable. It, it's very unreliable, it's intermittent. And by the way, there is, the learning curve has been extremely good on solar and wind, and I guess we hadn't anticipated that quite. And that's very promising, so we must keep doing that. But, you know, when people tell you that, you know, wind and solar is cheaper than existing energy, like uh, using current, uh, you know, nuclear plants, it's, it's not correct. Per kilowatt hour, it may be correct, but the problem is that the energy which is produced is produced at the point of time at which the energy price may be low, the electricity price may be low. So you have to look at the covariance between the production and the price, and it's going to get even worse. If 50% of your energy is solar on, or wind, that means that lots of the production will be at the point of time where the price will be zero or negative. Price of electricity will be zero or negative. So we need to develop solar and wind, of course, but we mainly need to do R&D to actually get the storage which goes with it and agree to transport it from southern Spain or, or northern Germany to where consumption is. And that's, that's why I think it's very important. So we need wind and solar very badly. Hopefully the learning curve will continue on the same trend, but you know we need not to put our eggs in the same basket. We need to have wide diversity of solution. A couple of questions, actually. Uh, so I have a question regarding the, the political feasibility of, the, uh, of a carbon tax. Now, in Switzerland, we had recently a referendum where it was closely voted down. But uh, the problem with the package that was, uh, so to speak, which we had to vote on was that it was kind of overloaded with lots of other things. Uh, and I am pretty sure that if we had reduced it to a proposal where we say explicitly, we pay back all the money to, to the citizens on a per capita basis or even in a way that the poor people get a little bit more, I'm pretty sure that it would have been a much better chance. There would have been a much better chance to get it, to chance to get it through. And I wonder, I mean, the politicians all over the world, they shy away from using the term carbon tax. So it's the, the term tax that is really, that kind of is the, brings heat in the deep debate. But if you give it back, 
you can call it differently. It's just giving back the money uh, to the citizens. And I am not so sure if, for example, in France, the yellow vest, I mean, if Macron would have said, we pay it back completely, do you really believe that we would have had these protests? If he would have at the beginning have, at the very start, have committed to paying it back, and everybody would have had a check at the end of the year, or the poorer citizens a bigger check, he could have prevented the protests. So, I mean, you are right, um, but Switzerland is Switzerland. You have a high carbon tax on heating, um, and that's well accepted. Um, in France, first, I completely agree with you. That was a big mistake not to have the compensation go with the tax. And I hope we are not going to do the same with a, the with a Green Deal. Uh, so the compensation has to go with the tax and, and be progressive, I think, so, so that the lowest income household will get more compensation. That's not going to be, you always have examples, uh, of course, people driving 100 kilometers a day, they will, they will uh, demonstrate because we're in France, they will block the roads, but, um, you know, the, the resistance will have been much slower in that case. Um, still, what we have noted in France is that people don't trust the state. So their view is that they don't trust compensation. They think more or less that, you know, you, they will get a check for a year or two, and then the check will disappear. So that raises an important issue with how you do it. Do you want to have some kind of mechanisms with independent agencies or courts involved so as to strengthen the commitment to that? And maybe again an adjustment, because if you increase the carbon price over the years, you might increase the compensation as well. Um, that I will be in favor also, the commission with Olivier Blanchard didn't have time to think about that. I mean, it was very clearly along your lines, but we didn't go far enough given the mistrust of the state in France. You know, France is a very spe special country. People expect everything from the state, but they, they have no trust in the state in politicians at the same time. <laughs> and that, that's, really, that's really a big, a big issue. Because, you, you know, I think you will go a long way by, by actually having compensation. So in the whole uh, carbon uh, emission discussion, of course, we have the arguments of China and India that we should distinguish between historic carbon emission emitters mm -hmm. and present carbon emitters. So, of course, currently China is one of the largest carbon emitters, but per capita is actually low. And historically, they are not the major carbon emitters. How do you factor this in into your whole discussion about, let's say, a carbon tax? How do you factor this in in terms of compensating uh, present carbon emitters who have not been major carbon emitters in the past? So in theory, it's easy because we, we want to do what Ernst just said. At the national level, you can do it at the international level. So you have a transition. Within Europe, you can compensate Germany and, and Poland for, for coal miners. So you want to protect the workers against what's going to happen to them. And at the international level, which is your question, you, you could have uh, compensation for poor countries. Now, that, that leaves the question of where China stands. But you know, they say rightly so that they want to finance their devo developments and in a sense, the answer we have, a green fund, is again a check. Uh, I will say a few things about that. Uh, the first is that the best way to do it is actually by giving free permits. You know, you are going to sell permits, but you are going to give some permits to those countries. Historically, that's what has happened. I was, in, uh, I was at MIT still in 1990 when there was a Clean Air Act amendment, basically creating a cap and trade system for SO2 and NOx, getting rid of acid rain. It worked very well. Almost overnight, the, you know, the emissions went by, down by 50%. It worked very, very well. But of course, there were many years of negotiation ahead of time because the Midwest didn't want actually to have a price on SO2. So basically what happened is that they got lots of free permits, they got bribed, just like the way 
Eastern Europe and Russia got bribed in Kyoto, right? You get free permits. The electorate doesn't know. I mean, it's, it's terrible what I say. I hope you know, nobody is going to record what, what I just say. But you know, I didn't read in the Boston Globe. I was reading the Boston Globe and or the New York Times. Nobody was saying, you know, we are paying for the West. Are, there is huge financial transfer to the Midwest. Now, if you tell the Texas person, we are going to give lots of money to China and to India with your taxes. That sounds <laughs> terrible, right? It's not going to fly. And you know, part of the failure of the Green Fund is exactly about that. Um, you can do a little bit better by giving free permits. Um, but in the end, I want to insist on something. You have to give money, just like in a domestic level. If you tell India you can finance your development and have a carbon tax equal to three, three dollars per ton, we are running against the wall. It's going to be a big disaster because all those countries are going to have more and more coal production. And, you know, and the growth in emissions is going to come from those countries. And I understand their, their complaint, and you too. I mean, we understand their complaint, they are right. But if you let them without carbon price, forget about climate, climate change, it's done. Uh, so we need, we need actually to have, uh, to have some compensation, but, uh, and Lucas could tell you more about this, I don't know where Lucas is, but, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, but you know, the, it's, it's hard actually to, to bargain 200 countries, each saying I want to pay less and I want to get more money. You need, it's pretty hard, and you know, in the end, you need some kind of rough formula which is going to basically explain who's going to give the money and not. And designing the formula is pretty complicated, to be honest. But you know, we need to, to do that if we want to go anywhere. And the formula can include maybe not dollars, but pollution permits too. On that note, let's have a look at the poll result and see how optimistic everyone is about a global deal. Um, pretty pessimistic, I would say. A little more optimistic than the panel that we saw. So 47% say it's, it's very unlikely. Where are you on this spectrum? I, I said I, I want to be optimistic, so I'm, I would say unlikely, but the truth is that I, I think it's very unlikely. Okay. <laughs> so you're an optimist, but also you're a realist. <laughs> And you're an economist too, so. I, I mean, the, uh, as I said, it's not going to come from the UN. If you have 200 veto rights, given that you have lots of oil producing countries and gas producing countries and ideological and populist countries, that's a little bit too much given that you need only one veto right to, not to get it. Sorry. Professor Turrell, I wanna thank you so much for your insights. A big round of applause, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, thank you. And on behalf of the UBS Center, I want to thank everyone for their participation, for attending in the first place. Again, I find it terrific to be in a room full of people. I hope you felt the same, and I think the interaction that we had was, was brilliant. So I want to thank everyone here in person, but also virtually. You, you really made a difference to this conference. Um, your feedback is going to be very important to the UBS Center. We kindly ask you to give your opinion today. Uh, there's a QR code which will be shown on screen, I assume. Um, and then you have a link with the questionnaire. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the center's upcoming events. Next year, the UBS Center will celebrate its 10th anniversary. On April 7th, they will kick off the anniversary year with the Wirtschaftspodium Schweiz. Um, they will take up the topic of the very first edition, actually, of the podium back in 2013, uh, Wirtschaftsstandort Schweiz, ein Erfolgsmodell in Gefahr. Um, on June the 20th, they will hold a lecture at the University of Zurich with Nobel laureate Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee on their new book, Good, Economic for, Good Economics for Hard Times. And obviously, it's still a while away until April, but the next webcast with Professor Jan Eckhout is on November the 23rd. He will talk about whether giant firms undermine competition and social 
welfare. So very important dates to be marked in your calendars. We are looking forward to welcoming you at one or many or all of these events. I want to thank everyone. Have a great evening. And above all, stay healthy. Thank you.